Got plantar fasciitis? Well, today we're going to discover three mostly unknown reasons with Eileen Kapsoftis. I'm Chef AJ. Welcome to Chef AJ Live. And please welcome Eileen to the show. It's great to see you. And what a fun topic. Well, maybe it's not fun, but a lot of people have it. It's fun for me because I love learning. Yes, yes. And this was your request, AJ, last month. So um, I was very excited to prepare this because it is, it's interesting, you know, when you research to see how many people are seeking this out, it's it's mind boggling. I mean, like 5 million hits will come up when you research this topic. So obviously it bothers a lot of people. And the data shows that about 2 million people a year um, are, are being treated for this. And a lot of people wait before they seek treatment, right? They try all the conventional stuff that all the internet searches will yield. And sometimes some of it does work, but unfortunately, most of the time it doesn't. And these people's lives get really disrupted by this. So I'm really hoping that this is going to help a lot of people. Uh, I know, we, you know, we've only got an hour, so I can't go on and on about it. But I do have an exciting thing to announce um, at the end of my PowerPoint. I'm going to share something I'm planning to help people even more with this. So very excited. Can't wait. Okay. All right. So I guess I will uh, share my screen. Right. And... Not sure, where am I for sharing my screen? Usually something, oh, you know what I have to do? I have to change my view, I think. And yes, change my view and now I can share my screen. And here we are. All right, so this is showing up for everybody, right? Okay. So, yeah, perfect. perfect. Uh, as, as this was also AJ's assistance with the title of this, Move Well to Age Well. Um, obviously, you don't have to be older to be struggling with plantar fasciitis pain, but uh, it'll make you feel like you're older because you're hobbling around in a lot of pain. So what I want to do, because we do have limited time, this is just a one hour presentation. Um, I'm going to share the three mostly unknown reasons for plantar fasciitis. And it's going to take me a couple of minutes to explain this because you're going to be scratching your head going, huh? How could that possibly be a cause of plantar fasciitis. And I, so I'm not gonna spend you know, 20 minutes going on about orthotics and heel cups and, and shoes and footwear. And I, I'm not gonna go into any of that stuff. I'm gonna really stick with this, okay? But there is one footwear that I'm gonna mention though, because I think you really need to know it. So my favorite statement is understanding authentic human movement leads to better training choices with improved results, right? I mean, it does. You, you really need to know, okay, is that authentic human movement or is that, oh, that's, that, that's not something my body would ever do. And if you've watched me more than once, you know, I'm, I'm a big one on that, right? So, and again, I have to say, you know, this is for educational purposes only. I'm not diagnosing or treating anybody here. Please don't substitute this for medical advice and so on and so forth, right? This is just education only. So here we go. Plantar fasciitis. It, it is pain. It is pain in the plantar surface of the foot, the bottom of the foot. It can be right at the heel. Uh, I'm going to mention something about heel spurs. You might be surprised to find out that they are not the cause of plantar fasciitis, which a lot of people have been led to believe. Um, and, you know, you might have a very well-meaning but misinformed healthcare practitioner who's doing their best to help you, but they not, may not be aware of this stuff. People can only share what they know, right? They can't share what they don't know. And as AJ said earlier, she loves to learn, right? So, and most healthcare practitioners love to learn too. And they're very, very discerning as to the source of their learning that it's accurate and it helps people, right? So hopefully you'll be able to share this and, uh, and they will want to learn more. So it can be at the heel, it can be right under the arch. You can even get some pain up into the toes. That's not as common. Um, so these are the common symptoms of plantar fasciitis. Obviously, if you're experiencing this, you could have some other things going on as well. But this is really like clinical diagnostic. This is plantar fasciitis. The pain in the foot is worse in the morning or, or after prolonged sitting or lying down, down. So once you're resting and you're not weight bearing, when you, when you go to get weight bearing again, it hurts worse again, right? That pain will lessen with movement over time, typically. I'm not saying it goes away, but you know, if it's like an eight out of 10 when you first get out of bed, after you're moving around, it might be like a four or a five out of 10, it lessens, right? 
Stairs are usually quite difficult when you've got plantar fasciitis, and, and there's a big reason for that. It requires a lot of dorsiflexion to go downstairs. Um, it will flare up after prolonged physical activity or exercise. So I'm not saying specific exercises that you've been given to treat this or address this by a professional. I'm saying typically, you know, this person will go to the gym or they'll do their run or they'll do whatever it is that they love to do. And as soon as they're done with that activity and they stop, the pain will flare up, right? And it's very common to have some stiffness. And I think it was like 70% of people who have this report stiffness in the Achilles tendon, which is that tendon that comes up over the heel up into the calf. Now, it's, it's called plantar fasciitis. And we all know itis typically is a medical term for inflammation, right? You may be really surprised to hear this, but the data is proving this false. It is not really inflammation. A better term, a more accurate term would be plantar fasciosis because it's a thickening of the fascial sheaths in the foot and impaired blood flow. When the researchers are looking at these feet of these people who have these symptoms, the pathology that they're studying, whether by ultrasound or whatever tools, lacks any inflammation being observed. There are no inflammatory cells. So it's not inflammation. So what does that mean? That means, well, a lot of the things we're using to reduce inflammation are going to be relatively useless because if it's not inflammation, addressing inflammation isn't going to help, right? That's kind of common sense 101. So now I want to talk about just briefly, I want to list well-known causes. So when you research the internet, even on all the medical sites, right, you're going to see this listed as well-known causes. Tight calf muscles is considered a well-known cause. Dysfunctional foot structure. Now, that's not everybody. That's some of the population. And I do want to tell you, if you're one of those people who has some issues going on with foot structure, the bones itself, the joints itself, um, it doesn't mean that you can't make things better. A lot of the times, and I've seen people where they almost think, oh my gosh, well, I've got this problem. There's nothing I can do about it. A lot of the times when you do the right things, when you train your body the right way, even if there's a structural issue, you will see improvement, right? I've had people who, you know, they were destined for a joint replacement. And I told them, I was, well, you train your body the right way before that surgery, after that surgery, you're going to be golden. You're going you're gonna to recover so much more quickly. You're going to have the best outcome possible from after that surgery. So there's always things you can do that will be helpful, no matter what is going on. Um, the actual cause behind plantar fasciitis is still not clear. So, you know, this is what all the, the scientists are saying. They're like, they don't know. Even the medical, you go to all the medical websites and you'll find this in almost every one of those sites. The actual cause is still not clear. So it's kind of like that. If you saw my, my back presentation here with Chef AJ and I showed a pie chart where 70% of people with low back pain diagnoses, the cause is unknown, right? So this is another one of those things. It's really a prevalent problem but nobody really knows what causes it. There's all these, these theories and guesses like tight calf muscles, right? Now, dysfunctional foot structure, that, that's a given. But what about overuse? You see this on almost every website you go. Actually, I think I saw this on every single website. Even in every single study, this was mentioned in the, the written literature in the study, overuse. So my question is, you know, my husband and I, you know, he's, he's very logical as well. And so we're talking about this and we're going, well, that doesn't make sense because if overuse was the issue, then every single athlete, every single runner, every single teacher and waitress and cashier and people who have to stand all day, they'd all have it and it would never go away, right? So overuse really, to me, I think is just kind of a catch-all phrase that they, because it's more common Plantar fasciitis is more common among athletes and runners and teachers and, and waitresses and cashiers and all those people who stand for a long period of time. It's more common, but it doesn't affect them all. So, you know, the rest of them aren't standing on their hands. <laughs> They're still using their feet, right? There's also a thing where it's a little more common with people who are obese, people who are carrying excess weight. But again, it's not everybody. 
So, um, you know, I don't know that obesity is the reason, right? But about 2 million people a year are getting treatment for this. And then here's another one that's very commonly proclaimed on all the sites is excessive pronation or a flat foot. And there's a lot of things that are done to address these things. And sometimes these people end up being being like so thankful that they're finally out of pain and their feet feel good again. But a lot of the times the things that they're using to address the flat foot will end up being a causative factor for another painful body part. I mean, I, I had somebody on my YouTube channel who, who wrote in and said that, you know, they got the orthotics and, and it worked beautiful and there's no more foot pain, but now they have severe knee pain. And a lot of people wouldn't put that together. They'd think, oh my gosh, am I falling apart? First it was my feet. Now my feet are better. Now it's my knee. A lot of the times those things that are used to intervene to help or potentially fix the foot problem ends up altering the the reaction that occurs in the body from the ground up so that other body parts are now being injured or irritated or annoyed, like your low back or your hip or even a shoulder, a neck, a knee. So it's important to know this, right? All right, so I did wanna show this to you. This is a heel spur. They the, the data is now very clear that heel spur is not causing the plantar fasciitis. It is a result of an abnormal pulling that's happening. And I learned this back in college. It's called Wolf's Law. It's um it's a law of the bone will grow or respond according to stresses placed upon it. Weightlifters have the densest bones because of that pulling on, on the bones where all the muscles attach. So what's happening here is there's an abnormal pulling going on, creating this heel spur. But they've, they've pretty much proven that the heel spur itself is not the cause of plantar fasciitis. So people who are having surgery to remove the heel spur end up still having plantar fasciitis and now recovering from surgery. So now there is something where, where they're missing a fat pad under the heel. And so, yeah, that spur could be aggravating because there's no there, there's fat pad missing. So there are some other issues. So please don't think I'm making this blanket statement. I just want you to be aware that this is what the data is showing, right? That heel spurs are no longer considered the cause of plantar fasciitis pain. And many people show heel spurs with no plantar fasciitis pain. Okay. All right. Now, this is the one thing I'm going to talk about footwear, and it's flip-flops. You can consider flip-flops like the bikini of footwear, right? And the connective tissues on the bottom of the foot are required to shorten because the toes have to constantly clench in order to keep the flip-flops on. So it's the, it's the action that the foot has to perform to keep these on the feet that forces those foot muscles to work overtime and the natural gait gets altered. So these are really not the best thing. If you're at the beach, and it's a very short time you're using them or wearing them, that's fine. But some people put these on in spring and they don't take them off until fall. And that's not necessarily a good idea. Over time, it could really wreak some havoc. Okay. All right. Now, I want to just briefly mention common plantar fasciitis treatments because I want to make sure I've got time to explain to you the mostly unknown causes and teach you some movement. To address it because it's all about, it's not just about knowledge, right? It's about applying it and knowing what to do with it. So these are the common treatments for plantar fasciitis, arch supports, orthotics, heel cups. Now you might find it interesting that a lot of the data shows that the orthotics, the over-the-counter orthotics are seen to be as effective as the expensive made for you orthotics. And we're talking plantar fasciitis here now. If you've got a structural foot issue and you've got an orthotic made specifically for that, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about if it's just for plantar fasciitis, over-the-counter is found to be just as effective in the data and they're a lot cheaper. So just to let you know that, um, heel cups. And then medications, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen. And if, if fat, plantar fasciitis was truly an inflammation, then those might help. Now, they may help a little bit if you've got a, a little bit of inflammation going on as a response to the pain. However, 
because it's truly not seen as an inflammatory issue anymore, why would we take anti-inflammatories, right? And then rest, ice, massage. These things are commonly recommended. When you do research on the internet, which I've been doing now for quite some time, knowing I was going to present this, I wanted to make sure my information was up to date, right? So this, these, this information is advised everywhere you go. And rest, I mean, you know, you, you can't walk on your hands. You got to walk on your feet. But obviously, if you're if you're an athlete, say you like to run or you're somebody who loves to walk, you know, you can refrain from those things. It just it decreases the quality of life. But but you can do those things. Um, ice, again, is to address inflammation. If it's not inflammation, how is it going to help? Massage. We're, we're talking here massage of the plantar fascia. And, you know, some of these things might give a little bit of a relief, but they tend to be temporary, right? Corticosteroid injections are very much recommended. The interesting part is in the data, the data does not recommend corticosteroid injections. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a very high risk of rupture of the plantar fascia and the fat and fat pad atrophy, which means that fat pad that cushions your heel can literally atrophy. That's a side effect, a risk of the steroid injections, right? And it's because it inhibits fibroblast production and fibroblasts are these beautiful little cells <clears throat> that produce everything in your fascia. They produce the collagen, the, the, the um, fibrin, the elastin, they produce all the fibers, they produce the fluids. They basically maintain the health of your fascial system and, and the injections inhibit fibroblast production. So you end up with this atrophy of the plantar fascia, uh, the plantar fat pad, and many people end up with a complete rupture of the plantar fascia, which then requires surgery. So, and then the evidence of, there's a lot of other things that are recommended, platelet-rich um, platelet plasma, PRP. Um, and then there's some other things, there's dex prolotherapy, there's extracorporeal shockwave therapy. The evidence for those things is conflicting. There really, there, there is no really good evidence that shows those are really effective. So, you know, especially if it's something your insurance doesn't cover, try not to, you know, you don't want to shell out money for something that, that is really iffy, right? And then a lot of the times walking boosts and casts are recommended. And then of course, stretching, strengthening is very highly recommended and and this is, and the data shows that surgery is considered the last resort that the person will have wanted to have tried everything first. And if it doesn't resolve, then what they're saying is, let's do some gastrocnemius recession, which is where they literally lengthen the calf muscle surgically, um, or do an actual plantar fascial release, um, usually around the Achilles tendon, but it's up to the surgeon what's considered best for the patient. So, you know, I mean, if the reason is what I'm going to share with you, none of these things are going to address that cause, right? These things are all addressing the symptoms, the pain, which people obviously want to get out of pain. It's a horrible thing to get out of bed and put your foot down and feel a shockwave of pain go up through your body from your foot, right? That is not a pleasant life at all. But a really important question to ask when treating pain is, will this relieve the symptoms or resolve the cause? And, and you know, I, I remember talking to my dear friend's father one time, he had an issue with his elbow and he was gonna go get an injection. And I was certainly not telling him not to get the injection. I was simply saying, well, there, 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 there's probably a causative factor in your body. There's something not happening right with the biomechanics you may be able to train your body so that that resolves. And he was like, well, I could just go get the injection. And I said, well, if I was hitting you on the back of the head and you had a headache, do you want to take medicine or do you want me to stop hitting you on the back of the head? I mean, you know, so, so let's address the cause, right? Whenever possible. So here are the three mostly unknown causes of plantar fasciitis pain. You ready? Impaired dorsiflexion, and I'm going to show you what that means when I go down in the gym, with eversion and inversion. That's critical. If that's not happening, there's nothing in your body above your foot that's functioning at the right time in the right way. It's just not happening. Okay. Hip 
impaired loading of the hip. You're like, how on earth can my hip affect plantar fasciitis? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate down in the gym. And I'm going to do my best to distill a very complex topic into a simple, easy to understand way. Because I know you're not all, you know, physical therapists. You're not. And even a lot of PTs don't know this stuff. Um, unfortunately, that's one of the reasons I've got all the free stuff I offer, right? To get this stuff out there. Um, and then another thing is impaired trunk motion. Believe it or not, decreased rotation in the trunk can lead to things not happening right in the foot that can lead to plantar fasciitis. So I'm going to show you these things when I go down to the gym. But let me show you just a little anatomy. I'm going to go through this really brief so that we've got time for the good stuff. Um, dorsiflexion, this is when your heel stays down and you lift your toes up off the floor. Normal range is about 20 degrees. So this would be zero if the foot's in neutral, right? And then you lift those toes up, it goes up to 20 degrees. That's normal. Some people have 30, they have pretty good mobility, right? A lot of people have like zero, maybe five. Some people are literally stuck in the opposite motion, which is plantar flexion. And you would be considered, you would literally call it a minus five or a minus three or a minus eight. They don't have any dorsiflexion at all. And if you've got a past history of ankle sprains or a past history of being non-weight bearing on a limb for any reason, bunionectomy, um, any kind of surgery, um, you know, impaired weight bearing, maybe you had a total joint replacement, maybe you had a fracture, any reason that you were non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing or painful weight bearing on one side of the body, you may have lost dorsiflexion and not even know it, not even know it. And I can't tell you how many young athletes I've worked with, 13, 14 years old, who had an ankle sprain. They thought it was all healed. All was good. They went back to sports. Now I'm seeing them because they have a shoulder problem because they're a pitcher or they've got a knee problem or a hip problem. And it's because that ankle had never regained healthy, full dorsiflexion. So this is critical, right? Now, we've also got something called eversion and inversion, and I found some really good pictures for you to look at. So eversion is when the outside of the foot lifts up and the weight goes on the inside of the foot, and inversion is the opposite. Your heel inverts and everts. Now, when the front of the foot goes along with what that heel is doing, that's now called pronation and supination. So with eversion comes pronation and with inversion comes supination, but it's because of what the front of the foot is doing versus what the heel bone is doing. So that's why they're different terms, okay? And a lot of people are told they excessively pronate. Well, why are they excessively pronating? Is it because the heel does not invert? and allow the ankle to come out of pronation and move into supination, we have to look at these things. We have to understand the mechanics of the foot. And then in order to really address the, the potential causes of plantar fasciitis in your world, we have to understand how the foot literally feeds motion to the body and the body literally feeds motion to the foot. They're, they're, it's back and forth. It's a give and take. They go together. And if it's not happening properly, it can set up your foot to experience plantar fascial pain, right? So here's, you know, here's your tibia, your shin bone. This is the fibula, that little bone on the outside of your ankle. And then you've got something called the talus. And that talus is the only bone in the body that does not have any muscles attached to it. So why do you think that is? It's because that bone responds to movement and gravity, ground reaction force, mass and momentum, all the physics stuff that happens when we move our, our bodies. Muscles do not directly impact talus function, but the muscles that are attached to the other bones can definitely impact talus function, right? 
You've got something called a sub tailor joint. It's between the talus and the heel bone. So you can think of it if we kind of put a hinge here and just opened up the front of the foot, you'd be looking at the front of the calcaneus bone, right? And then you'd see the talus on top. In between those two bones is a sub tailor joint. And that sub tailor joint is what reacts to your heel everting and inverting. So I'm gonna show you a little side view here. I've only got a couple more slides of anatomy here, but I want you to see this. So here's the side view. Look at your heel bone. A lot of people think their heel bone is only back here. Look how big it is. It comes all the way to the midfoot, right in front of the shin bone. It's a big honking bone, right? And because this calcaneus inverts, your foot supinates. Because the calcaneus everts, your foot pronates. If it doesn't do that, this isn't happening. That's where the havoc begins. So you've got two major joints. You've got a lot of joints in the foot, but the most important ones, well, they're all important for healthy foot function, but the ones most people are aware of is the true ankle joint, which is between your shin bone and your foot. That's where dorsiflexion, plantar flexion occurs. And then you've got your subtalar joint, which is what triggers everything else to happen. Now you've got different regions in your foot. You've got a hind foot, which is your calcaneus and your talus. You've got your midfoot, which is your tarsal bones. And you've got your forefoot, which is the rays that go to your toes. And so you've got your ankle joint proper. You've got your subtalar joint. You've got your mid tarsal joints, right? You've got all these joints and they all respond to what happens at your heel bone. So if your heel bone is not inverting, this is a left foot, okay? If that heel bone doesn't go in toward midline, you're not gonna get healthy supination. Your foot is not going to lock and provide stability and your plantar fascia is gonna get trashed every step you take. If your heel bone is not everting properly, and this is the left foot again, so it's moving away, outside, away from midline, then your subtalar joint is not going to rotate down and in and provide a nice shock absorbing, flexible foot that handles things when you're walking so that your fascia doesn't get trashed. These two motions are critical. And because of this, because of inversion, now this is the right foot. Sorry, I didn't, couldn't find everything to, to line up. Everything was left or everything was right. So this is the right foot. When that calcaneus, that heel bone inverts, which means it moves in toward midline, your talus bone rotates up and out, which causes your foot to supinate, but it also causes your leg bone to rotate externally. And because of that external rotation, everything above gets turned on or switched or whatever terms you want to use. It basically tells everybody above, let's get going. We got to turn out. We got to do this. We got to do that. When your calcaneus everts, remember, this is the right foot. So it's moving out away from the midline. That talus rotates down and in and it unlocks the foot, but it also internally rotates your leg bone. See the difference? Internal rotation, external rotation. All this stuff has to happen for healthy gait, for healthy body function in everything you do. So this plantar fascia is not happy when that eversion and inversion is not happening because it's going to get abnormally worked, irritated, annoyed, very unhappy, potentially injured. You, you, can, you can end up with, with tears, right? In the plantar fascia. And remember, data says it's not an inflammation. They do not see inflammatory cells as part of the pathology. They're seeing impaired blood flow, they're seeing injury, but they're not seeing inflammation. So all those treatments for inflammation are not gonna work. So real foot function. Your foot has to be what's called a mobile adapter. 
It absorbs shock, it's flexible, and it's what's called unlocked. That's when your heel bone lands. That's when eversion happens and pronation happens. You need pronation. If you've got somebody telling you we have to stop pronation, you'll probably end up with some issues above the foot. The foot also has to be a stable propeller so you can push off to take your next step. It provides firm strength, a solid surface, and that's when that subtalar joint is locked. That's when inversion happens and supination happens. So we have to have all these things. We can't limit one because the foot hurts. Sure, it might make the foot feel better, but nothing above is going to work right, not the way it was designed. And so I want to share this. This was one of my students in my, my academy that I, that I do live. I have a live class right before this with my academy students. And this was an email that I got. This got me so excited. I couldn't stand it because, and then AJ, when you asked me about me doing plantar fasciitis, I'm like, yes, this was her email specifically. I have to tell you my plantar fascia, fascia was getting a little better, but was still hurting if I walked on solid ground. And this was because she had taken some of my past events. I did your plantar fascia classes during my first week of joining the academy because I did a specific one in the academy for the students. And after a week of doing them every day, I'm completely fine and able to wear any shoe I have before I had to wear Crocs with two pairs of socks or a plantar fascia drugstore orthotic and stay on the green belt or the sand, which is in California. Now, I'm not promising every single person who does what I teach today is going to be without pain. But hopefully this is a start for you to understand how your body really works and why nothing else has been helping with your plantar fascia pain and how this could potentially really, really help you. Okay. So what's your goal? Do you want relief of symptoms or do you want resolution of the cause? And this is what I'm offering. I am so excited to be doing this. It's absolutely free. It's an exercise away plantar fasciitis three day challenge. And it's May 16th, 17th, and 18th. If you go to this website, you can sign up today and you will get the links to join us live and it will be recorded if you can't be there live. So I really want to, you know, my passion is to erase pain from the world. And when I started researching this and saw just how horribly prevalent this was, obviously I've treated tons of patients in the 30 years I've been doing this who have this issue, but I realized that you, the public needs to know this stuff, right? Because it's mostly unknown. All right. So I am going to head down to the gym. Um, I know we're kind of limited, so we'll wait to the end for questions and whatever time we've got. That sounds great. We, we actually have one question that was submitted on foot pain, so I can save it for the end if you like. Okay, perfect. All right. I'm going to head downstairs. Okay, I'll talk to everybody. Hi, is everybody doing today? Thank you so much for being here live or watching on the replay. I hope you can come back today at 4 p.m. Pacific time for another live show with Dr. T. Colin Campbell. It is my 1500th episode, so I'll probably put on a fancy shirt and I couldn't have done it without you, the viewers. So thank you so much. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing that because I'm very close to 200,000. That would mean a lot to me. So I can't wait to learn these exercises because I actually do have plantar fasciitis in my left heel. I've tried acupuncture and it really hurt. Usually acupuncture helps, but for this, it actually hurt. So I'm going to ask Eileen what she thinks about that. And here she is. Oh, okay. So let me um, put it so that I am bigger and see myself better. Okay. So, all right, can, everybody can see me okay? Perfect. Okay, so um, as you saw, and I know some of you might be kind of feeling a little bit like deer in headlights, right? You're like, oh my gosh, really? What? Oh, what? So I'm going to just reiterate very simply the three mostly unknown causes behind plantar fasciitis. One is the heel bone not moving properly in and out, eversion, inversion, while the foot is dorsiflexed. And I'm going to show you that in gait. So move my chair out of the way here. So the goal is when I go to take a step, okay, I land on my heel bone 
and a healthy gait, you're going to land just a little bit on the outside of the heel bone. You're not going to land smack dead center on it. And because of that, believe it or not, because of how that heel is shaped, gravity takes over. And of course, mass and momentum, which is a physics thing, because my body's moving. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. So that's the physics thing, right? That mass and momentum. So when I land on that heel, because of its shape, and I'm, I'm landing a little bit on the outside, automatically gravity and mass and momentum is going to cause that heel to kind of go down and in, which is what creates the eversion. So that heel bone everts just because of how I'm landing on it and because of gravity and mass and momentum. When that heel bone everts, that talus, that subtalar joint rotates down and in, I'm now pronating, which we have to pronate. Many, many years ago, they created shoes that stopped people from pronating and it just about killed everybody. The back pain, the, the knee pain, everything that happened was ridiculous because of people wearing those shoes. So, you know, we, we got to stop and think. We don't want to stop a motion the body's supposed to do. We want to make sure it's doing the motion in a healthy way at the right time, right? So the heel bone, everything drops down and in. I pronate my foot. When that happens, I have a nice, flexible, shock-absorbing foot. It's unlocked. And because the foot does that, the plantar fascia doesn't get abnormally yanked. Because if the foot stayed solid and stable, the plantar fascia would be like, ah, ah, it would be absorbing all the shock. It would be doing all these things, right? So we want that motion. Now, when I go, when I when I go to come off that foot and push off that toe, right, to create that beautiful propulsion to take my next step, that's the back phase of the gait. What happens now is that heel bone, because of everything else that happened, because of the calcaneus everting and the talus rotating down and in and the, the shin bone rotating in and the thigh bone rotating in and, and the trunk rotating opposite direction and the hip loading in the front, which is now triggering the external rotation to occur. And now it goes from the top down and it triggers the inversion of the foot. So right before I go to push off that foot, guess what? It's locked, it's stable, it's supporting me really well, and it's not asking the plantar fascia to do all the work, which it's not designed to do. So hopefully that makes sense, right? So what you wanna do is you want to train your foot the right way from the ground up, and you wanna train your body the right way from the top down to promote healthy foot function. And in the event that I have coming up, you know, I'm going to be going a lot more detail into these things, not making people become physiology experts, but more detail into how they relate and how they impact each other. You know, today I, I wanted to really give you something that you could do, right? Because we were like, once we learn something, it's like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? That's what matters most. So what I want you to first learn is how to make sure your foot is dorsiflexing and everting and inverting okay so there's a special movement that you can train your body to do now i'm going to use a chair so that i can be sideways and you can see me really well when i do this movement but ideally you'll use a wall so you have a nice solid support a nice base of support for your hands and you're going to put the foot back that you're going to be working now the foot that goes back, you don't want to go back so far that you feel pain. And you don't want to go back so far that when you come forward, your heel comes up off the floor. Because if your heel's coming up, you're not getting dorsiflexion. Remember, dorsiflexion is when the toes come up toward your shin or when your shin comes closer to your toes. That's dorsiflexion, right? So... You're going to have that foot be back. You're going to make sure your toes are pointed forward because your foot, if you're lacking dorsiflexion, you will notice this. Your foot wants to turn out. It won't be nice and straightforward. So you're going to have it back as far as it can go without pain and you can keep the heel down. Toes are forward. You're going to keep that knee nice and straight and you're going to rock forward 
with your hips. So this is going to load and unload the calf muscle. Now it's not, yes, tight calf muscles can be a big player in this, but they're not the only cause. That's, that's really kind of a common understanding. But if you're not everting and inverting in dorsiflexion, you can stretch the calf all you want. And most people, when they stretch the calf, they're doing this, right? Or God forbid, they're sitting down and they got a TheraBand or a towel and they're pulling their foot up, which is practically useless because there's no weight bearing going on. So, but most people, when they do it, they're only doing one plane of motion. They're just doing sagittal plane. They're just going forward and that's it. That doesn't promote eversion and inversion. So how do we promote eversion and inversion? I'm glad you asked. You're going to you're going to do the forward motion first to to loosen everything up, do a good 15 reps or so. Then you want to come forward to load. So I'm now loaded in dorsiflexion and you're going to go side to side with your hips. When you go side to side with your hips, you are now promoting inversion and eversion. So if my right foot is back, if I have my hips go to the right and my hips go to the left, you can feel that heel bone, right? So when my hips go right, the heel bone likes to go in. When my hips go left, that heel bone likes to go out, right? You can literally feel that, that motion happening, right? So that's going to help to promote eversion, inversion. Now, there's a lot of other ways to get that. You can do a lot of things. You can do, you know, you can do stepping, right? If you're somebody who excessively pronates, you might want to focus on just getting the inversion to promote supination. You can rotate, which will help. There's a lot of other things you can do, but I'm giving you the basic beginner start, okay? Now, you do also want to be rotating. So after you've done the side to side motion, you can come back and take some stress off for a minute, then come forward again to make sure you're fully loaded in that dorsiflexion first, and then you're going to rotate. And when you rotate, kind of think about if your belly button had a flashlight and you're just waving that across the wall in front of you, you want to get that nice rotation. And so when I rotate to the right with my right foot back, I'm getting supination, which is that inversion. And when I rotate left, I'm getting pronation, which is promoting eversion, right? So if you're excessively pronated, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do the pronated movement. Ideally, you want your body to learn how to go in and out of it in a healthy way, right? So because when you're going into pronation, the muscles and the joints that slow that down and control that are getting trained to control it better, to come out of it. So don't think about the fact you should only do one motion. The idea is for that foot to be able to go back and forth between the two in a healthy, healthy way. I've seen people where they they couldn't believe the difference in their pain and, and even like knees and, and hips and low back and shoulders and neck and everything because of that whole chain reaction that occurs from the ground up. Okay. All right. Now I want to show you about the two other parts and just checking my time here. Cause I know we, we got a time limit. So what we're going to do now is I talked about hip function. When you go to take that step and all that stuff happens and the rotated in and rotated in your hip has to go this way, right? So it's it's going this way as you shift your weight. Your knee bends a little bit. So your hip goes into flexion and what's called adduction and internal rotation. We want those motions. You don't have to remember any of those terms, but I want to show you, you want to make sure that your body is doing those motions and doing them in a really healthy way. So and then the other one coming out of it, we're getting extension, we're getting abduction, which the leg's moving away, and we're getting external rotation. So we want that leg, that whole leg, to be doing really good in the one phase and really good, good in the other phase. We're, we're, we're trying to make sure that leg is doing what it's supposed to be doing with every step 
you take, right? So ideally, a good thing would be to train the hips in, well, flexion extension, you can do, you can do squats, you can do, you know, coming forward. There's a lot of things you can do, but what I want to show you is three different movements that will really help your hips in all three motions coming in and out. And it's really simple to remember and simple to learn. Okay. So what you're going to do is if it's the right leg, my left leg is going to step forward. There's the extension and it has to control that. And it's going to step back and there's the flexion and it has to control that. Make sure I don't hit the wall. So you'll go forward and back. And when you go forward, try to keep your knees straight. And when you go back, let the knee bend and you'll get that beautiful flexion and extension of the hip. Now we want the abduction, or sorry, adduction, which is the leg moving in and abduction, which is the leg moving out. So a nice way to do that is to just step back and forth. This is going to really help promote the eversion inversion in the heel too. So you can just step across and step out, step across and step out. Now, if you've got any kind of balance issues, you know, make sure you're holding on to something. Obviously, if any of these movements hurt, you don't do them. Okay. It's not a good idea to do anything repetitively that causes pain because your brain is only going to think that you don't know enough to stop hurting yourself and it will find ways to cheat during the movement. So you're literally training in dysfunction. You're not fixing the problem. You're creating more problem. So if it hurts, don't do it. Back up and make the movement smaller. So if going forward and back is too much of a movement, then hold on to something right? And just do toes forward and back. You can just back it up and make it smaller, right? Same thing with going if this way and this way is too much, then just do toe tapping. Let that hip gain that strength and that ability to do that in a way that it's happy. And then you can build on it. After a while, you'll be like, oh, I can do this now, right? And then the last one is rotation. Rotation you want to make sure you're good and stable. If you've got any balance issues, you need to be very careful, right? But rotation, I'm just going to turn in and I'm going to turn out. That's all I'm going to do, in and out, okay? And that's going to train this hip to rotate in and rotate out nicely. And again, if that's too much for you and you need to back it up, just hold on and just do toes, turning in and out. So you're still getting the rotation, but it's less work for that hip because you're not stepping. There's less motion required and less work required. Okay. All right. That's hips. Now, I also mentioned trunk and you're all like, oh my gosh, what on earth can your trunk have to do with your foot? Everything. Because when your trunk is rotating in a healthy way, when you're walking, it's literally creating motion from your trunk down into your foot. And if that's not happening here in the trunk, it's not happening down there. It's being inhibited. Okay. So this is really an unknown cause that most people would be, are you nuts? But I'm going to show you. So when you go to take a walk, Think about it. I'm going to exaggerate it, right? But when I go to walk, when I step forward with my right foot, my left arm is going to come. I'm exaggerating this, but this is the rotation, right? With the arm swing, right? That's what we do. So think about it. If your arms are not swinging, right? So you want that opposite arm and leg gait. How many people, when they take a walk, have their hands in their pockets? or their arms are folded. So they're kind of inhibiting that, that rotation. They're inhibiting that arm swing, right? So, and, and, and you can see this, I've seen this with some of my patients when I do an assessment of their gait in the clinic, I've seen this many times, there's no arm swing. They're not rotating their trunk. And they've got a foot that's really pronated or both feet that are really pronated. They're not triggering healthy foot function from the top down. So you want to get that swing in there. 
So a good idea is to do some trunk turns. Just very simple. And like I said, there's a lot of things we can do. I'm, I'm giving you a kind of a beginner, you know, um, class here. But but the, the trunk rotation is huge. You want to rotate your trunk. So you can just do a simple trunk rotation, right? Just arms out and rotate as far as you can one way, as far as you can another way. But initially, just kind of see what is your healthy rotation? So when you see me, if I go to turn, look how far I can turn. I'm, I mean, you can almost see the back of my right shoulder. I can rotate so far to the right. And then to the left, it's the same thing. You can almost see the back of my left shoulder. That's full rotation. I see a lot of people, you know, when I tell them to turn, they're, they're like this. That's all they got. That's not full rotation right? They might not even have any pain. They feel like they're hitting a wall. They have no clue they've lost that rotation. Trunk rotation is notoriously impaired as people age because of lack of mobility, lack of proper training and understanding and knowledge. And it just sneaks up on them and they don't even realize it. So same thing with trunk extension. When people lose, lose flexion in their shoulder, they don't even know they've lost flexion. I tell them flex their shoulder and they bring their arm up. It's way out here. No, flexion's over here. It's right next to your head. And in order for that perfect flexion to happen at the top, my top T-spine has to extend, right? So people don't realize they've lost that. Rotation is a notoriously impaired motion as people age. So, and we're getting it more and more with the young folks now, right? With all the devices and all the cell phones and all the computer work and all this, everybody's like this all day long. So we really need to get that rotation. So it could be as simple as that. And if you've got one side that doesn't like it, sometimes this is a little trick. Maybe your body doesn't like turning left. You feel pain anywhere. Then just turn right. And after a couple days, you may notice, oh, I can go left now. Look at that. It kind of reset itself. I've seen that happen and heard that reported by more patients than I can count. So, all right. Hopefully this has helped you. I did want to make sure we had a little bit of time for questions. And I know we've got just a few minutes, but uh, I, I, love happy that. To... I love those exercises. Anybody can do them, even if they don't have plantar yes. fibers. Yes. Yes. Really big stretches. I, okay. So this was sent in by Ed. And he said, what would help with nerve pain on the top of the foot? I dropped a plastic container and hit the nerve on top of my foot back in November, and I'm still having pain on the top of my foot. I've tried joint creams and essential oils. Any ideas on how to get rid of nerve pain in the foot? Well, not knowing. I mean, I'm, I don't know if he's sought any medical uh, you know, testing or whatever, because there could be permanent nerve damage, depending on how hard that I mean, how heavy the object was, how much, you know, impact occurred. And if the nerve is damaged, nerve can take a while to heal. There's something called uh, Wallerian degeneration where it, it recovers itself at about one millimeter a day. So it can take a while depending on how much injury occurred. And, and it's kind of like these little Pac-Men go in there and eat up the injured cells and then they lay down new, new cells and it can take a while, like I said. Um, so it really depends. And I hate to not give a clear answer, but I don't know how much damage or injury or impact was done. Um, I do know that weight bearing will help the nerve to regenerate and grow to where it needs to go. Peripheral nerves like weight bearing. It kind of gives them a map on where they have to go. So that's about the best I can, I can do for that, not knowing the extent of the damage. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but can you work with somebody virtually on something like this or? Uh, on that issue, that would be hard put because I wouldn't be able to, to like really see what's going on. Um, I mean, there's always movements that can help things depending, like if specific weight bearing was causing problems, I often work with people to figure out, okay, is it sagittal plane the foot doesn't like? Is it frontal plane? Is it transverse plane? And then we start training the body to regain what it doesn't like in a way that it likes, right? Because it's not uh, supposed to be painful. Terrific. This is not exactly on the foot, but because it was sent in advance, I'd like to acknowledge it from Jan. And she says, Eileen, you often talk about moving in the various planes, which makes me wonder, is line dancing a good exercise to work on that? 
Well, um, I've never line danced. I've seen a lot of people do it. I have a lot of good friends who love line dancing. So I can't speak from any kind of experience of line dancing. But I do know that dancing is excellent for the body. You're moving all your joints. You're waking up all your proprioceptors. You're, you're always moving in all three planes of motion. It's not possible to only move in one unless you're practicing a robot dance. Um, and even then, it's, it's really hard to do that perfect. So dancing is always a good idea. If it's not painful, it's excellent, no matter what. Even like Zumba, you know, all that stuff. People love it. It, it just wakes up the body. It's what makes us feel so good. That's why hot tubs feel so good, by the way. When the jets are hitting those proprioceptors, it's waking everything up. So, but dancing does the same thing. Uh, Linda, who's watching live, wants to know if the exercises you showed could help somebody with sciatic pain. Well, sciatic pain, and I know we've only got a minute, so I'll try to make this quick. Sciatic pain can be from a couple of reasons. A lot of the times, it's a lack of motion happening in the pelvis. Yes, the foot and ankle can radically impact the motion that's happening in the pelvis. Um, and very often, if it's a low back issue, the low back is the victim because the hips aren't working right or the trunk's not working right. So, um, but there's different reasons for sciatica. And, um, but doing movement in three planes is always a good idea, no matter what the issue. Great. And people live are asking if these exercises could help with either tarsal tunnel or somebody with a fused ankle. So fusions, it depends on where the fusion is. If they're not, if they're fused where their heel won't evert or invert, this isn't going to restore that motion, but it might kind of help their body learn how to compensate because of that immobility that's happening in the joint. Um, you know, some people are fused and they can't, do more dorsiflexion or they can't plantar flex. Obviously, if the if the bones aren't allowed to do the movement, an exercise isn't going to restore the movement, but it may help other body parts to kind of compensate because they have to, they don't have a choice, right? Uh, tarsal tunnel, that's the, the, the that is a, an, a potential entrapment issue that's going on. A lot of the times, the reasons those happen is because that heel bone's not everting and inverting. And so you're not getting that subtalar joint locking and unlocking, creating a nice open, flexible foot. And then so, so that's always a good idea to train for that specifically um, because it's going to help to restore natural foot function. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you know what you have planned for next month? Have you done neck or shoulders yet? I have not. Okay, because so we'll there's a to... question that maybe we can save because somebody's asking about uh, myofascial pain in the neck and the shoulders. I don't think we've done shoulders. Shoulders, yeah, rotator cuff. Let's do everything yeah. that I've ever had injured on this show. <laughs> Sounds good, AJ. You tell me uh, and, and we'll You're do great. It. And it looks like you have a new haircut and it looks great. I love it. Yeah, yeah. A little bit shorter. Yes. It looks, it looks fantastic. Yes, yes. Thank you. We, we learned so Thanks. much from you, Eileen. I just, love, I really enjoy having you on. I love being here. Your audience is the best and I want everybody to move without pain and have lifelong well-being. So thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in just a few hours at 4 p.m. Pacific time when my guest is Dr. T. Colin Campbell celebrating my 1500th 